that the uh, United Church of Christ used back in its 2000 identity campaign came from the famed comedian Gracie Allen. Never put a period where God places a comma. Now, I'm an old radio fan, old television fan, I love old movies. So the Burns and Allen comedy team are very familiar with me, and I'm constantly reminded by Paul that nobody who is under 50 understands who Burns and Allen is. So you will just have to bear with me because Gracie <laughs> was a very unique individual. She was full of logic that was expressed in less than logical statements. For example, Gracie was wanting to join a prestigious book club. So she's busy around the living room, rearranging it and putting classical authors, uh, their books, you know, in strategic places. So that way, the person who is going to be doing the interview of her would think and realize just how uh, well-informed and well-read Gracie is. George Burns, her husband, enters in and inquires what she's doing, so he offers to help her. So he has a stack of books in his hands, and he's uh, asking her, oh, um, where do you want me to put this book? She says, well, which one is it? He says, it's uh, Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. He says, should I put it on the coffee table, uh, or where else would you like it? She says, after a very thoughtful pause, you better put it in the bookcase. And George says, well, why would you want me to put it in the bookcase? She says, well, I really haven't read the book yet, and one of the cities might be in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's only funny if you've read The Tale of Two Cities <laughs> and know which two cities it is about, of course. Well, many of us who believe that we have a good understanding of the birth story of Jesus, Epiphany can be like Gracie's confusion about Charles Dickens' book. The story of three kings bearing gifts to Jesus in a stable is solidly burned into our memories as part of the birth story. And yet, and why not? We've seen pageant after pageant incorporating this part of the story with the birth of Jesus. Epiphany, which is what we call this visit of the wise men, can be defined as a manifestation of a divine or supernatural being, or a moment of sudden revelation or insight. Now within our Christian church, we recognize it as meaning the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles as represented by the visit of the Magi. In actuality, we really know very little about these men, other than that they were referred to as wise men of the East. We don't know how many there were, really. Also, they show up not at Jesus' birth, but sometime after, possibly up to two years after Jesus was born. Nor do we know where to find, uh, nor do they really know where to find the king. Information about, uh, uh, information about needing to go to Bethlehem is given to them by the present king of Israel, Herod the Great, and only after he consults his own priests about this uh, birth. Scripture also tells us that they did not see Jesus in the manger, but in a house. If the vagueness of Matthew's account isn't enough, there exists also confusion about following the star that we saw in the east. There's no astronomical evidence uh, of events going on, such as a comet or a, uh, a nova, maybe, uh, because if there were, why would not Herod had already known that something special was happening? With Herod being so paranoid about a new king being born, 
Why didn't he send spies to follow the wise men to the nativity scene? Instead of just asking them to come back and deliver the location once they had seen Jesus in Bethlehem. And also, there is no historical evidence that Herod had a mass killing of infants, as reported in Matthew's account. If these are things that we focus on and try to make sense of in Matthew's account of the wise men and the birth of Jesus, then we are missing a real point of not just this story, but of the whole Gospel of Matthew and how Matthew sees who Jesus is. The Gospel of Matthew was written for the Hebrew reader. It was the purpose of Matthew to present Jesus as the new Moses. For you see, Epiphany is not a story about three kings. It is a story of two kings. One is housed in a grand palace, is called the Great, and gripped with fear and paranoia. The other is called Emmanuel, God with us. Love made flesh. He is born in a humble surroundings, visited by strange foreigners of unknown religion. For Matthew, King Herod symbolizes the new Pharaoh, the Jesus, and Jesus is the new Moses. Pharaoh, out of fear of the increasing of male Hebrews, ordered the death of a whole generation of male baby Hebrews. Moses is spared by being hidden in a basket floating in the River Nile. Herod the Great, in fear of a new king deposing him, or even worse, having Rome hear about a new king, which could bring death and destruction, not just to the Judean people, but also an end to his reign as a puppet king, orders the death of all male babies that were under two years old. Jesus escapes death as his parents warn in a dream to flee to Egypt. Matthew fortifies the comparisons between Moses and Jesus by quoting an ancient prophet that referred to Moses, as, uh, referred to Moses originally and applied it to Jesus that says, I summon my son out of Egypt. Jesus was the Savior of Israel, the Messiah, the King. Now, coming back to Charles Dickens, in that book of Tale of the Two Cities, it begins with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, and it was the season of darkness, and it was the spring of hope, and it was the winter of despair. In short, the period was so far like the present period. And one more quote, which Dickens records as the principles of the aristocracy superiority thought, repression is the only lasting philosophy. The dark deference of fear and slavery will keep the dogs obedient to the whip as long as this roof, looking up to it, shuts out the sky. These two quotes could easily sum up the conflict that Matthew is trying to reveal to us between the view of how earthly kings try to hold on to power versus how God's power is expressed. These words mirror the situation of those in Judea during the reign of Herod the Great. The life of the affluent was good. Herod was called great because of his massive building programs of the public buildings and of his rebuilding the Temple of Solomon uh, to outshine any other place of worship in its day. 
but he was also ruthless and cruel, filled with paranoia of losing his position of power, so much so that he had his own sons murdered, fearing that they might try to steal his throne. Herod represents an authority held by brutal physical force, deception, and violence, powered by wealth. Do we live in a similar world? A world that is powered by deception, threats, power held only by violence toward others? Do we live in a world where division is encouraged at the expense of unity? Is our world filled with fear instead of peace? I think, as Charles Dickens wrote, things are still the same today. Too often we equate Epiphany with the gifts of the Magi, asking what gifts should we bring to Jesus? The real question that we should be asking ourselves is, which king do we follow? Do we follow a king who remains on his throne by killing those who threaten him, whose kingdom is built on status, coercion, and fear? Or do we follow a king who suffered because of the hospitality, who survived because of the hospitality of strangers, whose kingdom is of justice, peace, grace, and love? In the story of Matthew, we see what happens in a world that is ruled by fear and greed, of the pain that comes when paranoia rules instead of reason. But we also see how God continues to guide those who are willing to hear. Through dreams, he warned the Magi to go home a different direction. Through a dream, he guides Joseph and Mary to safety found in Egypt. So as I was thinking about today's sermon, the song, I Wonder As I Wonder, came to my mind. And I want to share with you the second verse of this song. When Mary birthed Jesus, t'was in a cow stall, with wise men and farmers and shepherds and all. But high from God's heaven, a star's light did fall, and the promise of ages it then did recall. As we celebrate Epiphany, the festival of light, we can be assured that no matter what life throws our way, God is walking with us, guiding those who are open to God's guidance. It is a celebration that asks us, which king are we willing to follow?